Thank you, Dr. Glass. It's really an honor for me to be invited here today as a speaker, as an amateur. Thank you very much. Do you mind maybe using the microphone? Yes, way. Yes, you can lift it off if you want. You can hold it in your hand. Just speak. It's on. It's on. Okay. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. Much better. Thank you very much, Dr. Glass. It's uh, really an honor for me to be invited here today as a speaker, as an amateur astronomer, and I hope you will enjoy my presentation. Um, okay, my talking will be on monitoring of red back millisecond pulses. I know if you are familiar with a with a name red back. That's of that, that's of course the uh, a spider. You will find in Australia, I think it's a counterpart of a, a black widow spider you find in, in America, I'm not sure. <laughs> and um, so apparently, black widow spiders, uh, for red back spiders can get very large, as you can see. <laughs> So, just a little bit of background on uh, red backs in, in the black widow spiders. When astronomers um, study pulsars, they discover a very interesting type of uh, pulsar, which have a compact, uh, a companion in a very compact um, orbit with a low mass companion. And this is really extreme conditions with uh, shape of a companion may change due to the gravitational pull of the pulsar and because it's so close it sometimes you get that the uh, uh, gas from the companion star is blown off by the pulsar wind and may occasionally also um, pull off material from the uh, companion star to form an accretion disk. So they regard it sometimes as the ultimate laboratories for study of, of, of physics. Very interesting. So astronomers decided to divide this in, into two groups, redbacks and, and black widows. And they basically, based on the, on the weight of mass of a companion star, whether uh, redbacks have a slightly um, heavier companion compared to the Black Widow. Just want to uh, play a small video clip. Okay, we did. Here you can see the pulsar in the center, and of course the companion star. You can see the it's heating up from the one side. Uh, distorted shape of a companion star is blowing off a lot of gas from that star. So I've been observing one of these red light since 2014 called J1723-2837 um, and during that time I noticed something um, strange in the, in the light curve and uh, I started to do a more intense um, observations during 2014 and 2015 and during 2015 I see a very unexpected range of events actually so um, by the end of 2015 I've done more than 200 hours of observation on, on that star and uh, what I felt I will um, share with you in this presentation. So this is just a, a typical image, 300 second exposure. The arrow that, oops, the arrow is pointing towards the companion of a handbag passer. It's at magnitude 15.5. Okay, not very important, but the uh, declination of a uh, pulsar is at minus 28, so it provides me of a 60% uh, 
of an orbit I can cover in, in one night. So our orbital period is 15.8 hours. So here's a time series photometry. Like from 2014 to 2015. Shown in blue is the blue dots, the companion star, with a variation of approximately 0.1 magnitude. And just for a reference, the in red, the comparison star measuring around 3.6 million magnitudes for the same period. So by the end of 2017, I've done about 600 hours of observation on, on the particular star. Interesting is, yes, you will see um, a sudden drop in magnitude here in 2015 and also in between 2016 and 17. Something has never been observed before because they never observed um, these types of stars are so intense. Also interesting is that coincident with the drop in magnitude you see a sudden increase in activity in 2015 and I will go into more detail in that. So what causes the, the variations? The variations you see. So in short I'm not going to in much detail with this, but um, there's basically two types of effects that you will see. It. One is the ellipsoidal variation, which will be uh, two cycles in, in one orbit, and the other has to do with the effect of the heating of a uh, pulsar onto the companion star, which they refer to as irradiation efficiency. And that's normally uh, one cycle in, oops, in one moment. But what I like to point out to you, thinking in terms of frequency, the ellipsoidal signal will be 3.25 cycles per day. That's how we did convert from the orbital 14.8 uh, hours. And the irradiation efficiency is 1.6 to 5 cycles, but I refer, I, if I prefer rather to, to go for the uh, fundamental signal because um, it may be that this particular um, object does not uh, show much irradiation efficiency. efficiency. And uh, so I'll show you more detail on the fun, fundamental, sig fundamental signal. But in, in, oops. in short, I just want to show you this two cycles which will come out of this system. This, this is a, a normal case for um, this type of uh, red back stars. So I wrote this uh, very simple equation to model the, the system with a fundamental signal and the ellipsoidal signal as part of the um, equation and uh, also the residual at the back. The thing is what's important here is that if one take this um, model and you fit it onto the data, you will, can determine the coefficients A1 and A2, which will really give you the amount of uh, energy in these terms. Okay, so in 2014, if you, if you look at the life curve, um, uh, the, the phase plot, that was a reasonable good fit. Um, I could calculate the ellipsoidal variation was approximately that figure and almost no heat. As a matter of fact, I measured uh, a negative value for, for the heat. So it's really obvious that the dominant source for this object is the um, ellipsoidal variation. But comparing this to 2015, you see it is a really a bad fit of very large residuals. So it's obvious something must have changed. Now, if you compare this to phase plots, you see it much more variation in 2015. So to better understand what's actually what, what happened in 2015, we need to look at the frequency spectrum and as I previously said we're expecting 
uh, frequency, ellipsoidal signal, and also the fundamental signal. That's what we expect. So, in this slide, I calculate the periodic gram from data in 2015, and you can see very prominent the uh, ellipsoidal signal and uh, the fundamental signal is for a smaller signal over there. It's a lot of alias frequencies, don't worry too much about that. But let's look at this part. That they are in more detail. So, we expect to see that signal at the fundamental signal at 1.625. But what I actually measured was a signal at 1.634. So that's actually a, a new signal. And I may uh, tell you at this stage that this signal won't pop up from a few measurements. You need to do actually a lot of measurements before you actually will, will see that, that signal. Um, okay. So just a quick look at 2016. Now this is kind of very interesting because here we see indeed um, a peak at 1.625, meaning that there's energy in the fundamental frequency. And if you will notice there's also a little arm there on, on the right hand side. So what I did in this slide is I said subtracted the model from the data and I recalculate the periodogram from the residual plotted here in red and you will notice a similar signal at 1.634 so we see that signal now in 2015 and also in 2016 thinking in terms of frequencies we have now the, the new signal the ellipsoidal signal and the signal, so you can expect the uh, light curve frequency to be very complicated. Okay, if you, if you look at the, the phase diagrams, and this is now phase diagram for the, all the data from 2015 in the double plot, um, the line is the model signal and Below is the residual, the, the data, raw data, and the, the signal subtracted. And if you look at the residual, it's reasonable chaotic. But I put this in smaller groups from, from 1 to 6. And if we look at group 1, you will notice this looks more, looks more like a, a signal with a, with a tip in the data. Of course, the different colors and different markers is different types of observation. Looking at group 2, not much of a dip there. Group 3, you will notice a dip again. If you, if you look at the, the, the minimum of that dip in the next one, you will notice that it changes from, from there to there. A little bit drift to, to the left. Let's go back. Group 3 and group 4. And that was group 5, group 6, and then did the same with data from 2016. That's all the data from 2016. And once again, group 1, there's group 2, you see a reasonable dip in the data. Group 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So here, yeah, what can what can cause this dips? So I read a lot of related studies on red back millisecond pulses, and if I can summarize that in short, they reported on similar secular variations, and mostly unable to explain the cause of the very oops, unable to explain the cause of the variations. And like in this paper, we um, noted that the combination of ellipsoidal variation, heating, and star spot activities required to explain the light curve. 
But the problem as I see it, they all have to rely on limited observations. So professionals, observatories for obvious reasons can't observe night after night like, like I've done with this type of observations. Um, so I think the depth in the residual is probably a result of stellar activity, most likely star spots. Um, there's a drift in phase over time at the rate of 1.634, so showing the periodic gram. And what, what that means is that the companion star is not tightly locked to the pulsar. And in that case, it was possible to calculate the spin to orbital ratio with the new signal and the orbital period. So I think um, it's generally assumed with these comp compact ob uh, objects that um, the companion is tightly locked to the, to the pulsar. So I think this is quite something new, um, very, very unexpected. In short, um, conclusion. Uh, you're really interested in, in these values, the, the coefficient values, but you need to make sure that the, um, the model is, is the correct model. In this case, I added an extract, uh, which is a residual for stellar activity. Um, the other thing that's pretty important is that we saw the um, fundamental signal and the average magnitude changed on very short time scales and additionally with the residual signal. So this is all factors that will influence the calculated value of these coefficients. So I think continuous monitoring is really important but like I said professionals can't um, monitor night after night. I think it's a great opportunity for amateur astronomers to, to do observations with red bags. This is just to show that once you've um, calculated these coefficients, they are used by astronomers for more complicated models and stuff. So it's not that you've completed the, 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 the light curve and you put it on the wall and it's very nice. There's more to it. The, the real uh, science actually started with the results of, of your data. So I've been um, sharing my data in 2015 with an uh, astronomer from the University of Toronto, Canada, and uh, after a lot of Emails and correspondence is a guest, suggest that we uh, collaborate on a paper which was published by the end of 2016 as an APJ letter and was consequently a very nice press release associated with it. That was really a very um, a great honor for me to be um, working with a professional astronomer. Uh, John was very kind to me with. Uh, with sharing my data with him, and uh, I think I think he's a really talented astronomer. He's a, a number of awards, as you can, can see that. So, for me, sitting in Bratastor, Western Cape, and all of a sudden you work with a professional astronomer in, in Canada was a really a, a big, big, big thing for me. So some of the highlights from our paper, uh, we said it was the most densely sampled photometric light curve for any binary pulsar up to date. We illustrated the star experience for radiant activity, which we attribute to star spots. Possible presence of a strong magnetic field, which is always very interesting. And we saw clear evidence of asynchronous rotation. First direct interference of spin rate for any millisecond pulsar companion and we put new constraints on the parameters of irradiation, efficiency pulsar mass estimation and component masses and inclination. Just like to thank guys 
for any support in the NASA. Also, did a number of publications. And uh, many thanks to Dr. John for his interest in my observations and developing it to a neat publication. Thank you very much. Would anybody like to ask a question or make a comment? Okay. Okay. Uh, on this very, uh, very humble, <coughs> he was uh, awarded the Tony uh, Ulrich Medal last year for his work. Um, so he's not the only medal winner in this big exercise. Well done, Andre. Thank you. Thank you. I use uh, Munipack, it's called Muni, one mini, uh, Munipack, uh, that's for the photometry, photometry work. Um, yes. Well, I think this is an amazing example of how somebody can uh, find a niche where you have a natural advantage and uh, you know, I think an awful lot of very good astronomy has been done in that way. So, you know, when you work at a certain place like here, when I first came here, observing time was very easy to get compared to most observatories overseas. Some places you could easily build instruments, or, or other places, you know, you had terrific computer backup, very good programmers working for you and so on. So I, I think it's very important to take advantage of a niche or a special situation that you perceive. I think you've done a very good job of that. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.